Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of The Code of Career with me, Cameron Blackwood. Today's guest is Billy Williams. Billy is the engineering manager at Otter, which, as I'm sure you'll find relevant to the show, is a recruitment platform and a new way to get a job in tech. Like myself and many listeners to the show, Billy is also a career changer. He's had a lot of different lives already, so this makes a really interesting episode into how he got into the world of software. Just before we start, I'd really like to encourage people, if they can afford it and if they really enjoy the show, to please contribute to the Patreon. We have some unique tiers and benefits uh, for people that are members, and it'll be really cool to see some people take that up. If you don't have the budget, then do just feel free to just join our Discord. Uh, it's open to everyone, and you can chat with me and other listeners of the Code of Career uh, for tips and um, ways you can advance your career. But without further ado, it's time to grab a coffee, push those commits, and enjoy my chat with Billy Williams. Hi, Billy. Thanks so much for joining me. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thanks. I'm good. Just enjoying and loving life with my new microphone, as I was saying to you offline. Um, I say offline um, when, when we weren't recording. Um, so hopefully the guests are already hearing my dulcet tones coming through crisp and clear. Uh, so that is uh, very exciting times. And apologies to the uh, to the listeners who, um, uh, who put up with the buzzing noises in the last few episodes. It won't happen again. I hope. Um, but yeah, uh, it, all, all good over here. Um, just uh, getting um, getting stuck in uh, to uh, more podcasting after a couple of weeks off. So uh, all good. And uh, you must have been very busy recently as we'll get on to a little bit uh, later. Um, so for those who aren't familiar with you, do you want to explain um, about who you are, who you're working for right now and why, why it's such an exciting time to work with them? Yeah, sure. So uh, I am Billy. I am an engineering manager here at Otter. um, And Otter is a candidate first jobs platform. um, And it's super busy at the moment because we just launched a, uh, we just raised a series A round of funding of $20 million, um, which um, is obviously a very large amount of money, which means that we're looking to grow and scale our team in engineering. So we're currently about uh, eight engineers at the moment, and we're looking to scale to around 20 engineers by the end of 2022. So a very big uh, increase, but yeah, it's super exciting, very busy. And we're also really trying to push the boundaries on the product side of the business, as well as kind of just scaling the team as well. Very exciting. It sounds like you're having to wear a lot of hats, but uh, look, it sounds like a good uh, good challenge. And uh, the way the way we like to warm things up on Code of Career, um, as you may know, is uh, we have some quick fire questions, um, and uh, we love a, we love a little anecdote um, in the quick fire questions as well. So um, I don't know if you've got any stored up for those, um, but if we're uh, all good to fire away with those, what was your first ever computer? I because I saw this question before, and it's quite hard to remember because. Um, yeah, I think in comparison to some of the people in my team, I realize I just turned 30 and uh, your first computer when you're 30, it seems very, very long time ago. So it was like an HP, like, like desktop, like proper, like tower computer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it had a, like, it wasn't even an SD card slot. I think it was like an XD card slot for like the very original, like Fuji fine picks cameras. Mm um so yeah it was a bit of a monster and i think it was it was running 98 when we got it i think we upgraded it to xp which is uh, yeah that's how long ago it was <laughs> yeah very nice i think 98 was my first os as well um some good memories with that um well i mean we've had a range of computers like we've had people talking about computers they've had in the early 80s and uh, ethan who came on um a, a few months ago his first computer was a 2014 mac and he got it when he was like nine and I was like, oh no, <laughs> tell me, tell me I'm not getting old. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I, yeah, sounds like I had a fairly similar first computer and yeah, a lot of good memories on that. No doubt gave it countless viruses. Sorry, mum and dad. Um, but yeah, good, good yeah. memories. Um, I think it's, I think it's, it was having, I mean, yeah, LimeWire. I think that that was, was going to say LimeWire. Like that, that's <laughs> the one that makes you go back and you're just like, that was, that was a different time <laughs> on the internet than what we have right now. Yeah. Do you remember, um, oh, what was that other one? There was a like Russian one called Bear Share. Um, I used that one a few times to get music and no doubt destroyed uh, my computer several times with that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, it's just, it seems a, a literal lifetime ago when you think about how much everything in, in technology has changed since that point where that was like the absolute, like kind of like frontier of kind of like music streaming really. And yeah, just very, very different. 
Absolutely. Yeah. The kids don't know. Uh, <laughs> the kids don't know how tough we had it um, back, back in the day, uh, like, you know, torrenting stuff um, compared to just having everything for £10 a month uh, is, uh, yeah, times change. Um, speaking of tech, um, shockingly enough, seeing as this is a code of career, um, what is your favourite tech city in the world? So it'd be very easy for me just to say London because I'm not, I don't actually live in London, but I work in London. But I actually think like a underrated city for tech was one that I visited um, back in 2018 before the pandemic, um, which is actually Denver, which is unusual as a choice, but um, situated right outside the Rockies. It's actually got like quite a burgeoning like robotics scene. Um, it's also got great craft beer, craft coffee. Um, and, you know, you're 30 minutes from the Rockies. And actually, like if I was to, you know, make millions of dollars and be like, hey, like you can go launch anywhere. Like, I think that would be a really cool place to be. You're right in the center of the country. Um, and yeah, I think that it's a really underrated place to go. And I think I'd really recommend anyone that's kind of like thinking about like kind of like the Midwest or something like, or kind of like mountain mountain time. Like it's definitely a really cool place to, to stop off. And I then did an 18 hour journey from on the train from Denver to Chicago which sounds mental, but I can't recommend it enough. It's, mm. it's an experience. Train travel in the US is so underrated. Like I've done, um, I've done New York to Montreal, yes. um, which I think was supposed to be eight hours, but turned out being literally eighteen um, because <laughs> uh, their train routes are very scenic, but not the most efficient. Like you know, we we spend our entire lives in Britain complaining about the trains here, but actually. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. haven't seen bad railways until you go to States, but my God, they're scenic. Yeah, no, it's and like even like the nothingness is just insane how much of it there is as well. Like going through Idaho and stuff, like, you know, you just see lots of small towns and yeah, it's really, really great experience and um yeah, a great way to see the world. Yeah. We don't really um I mean, a li- little bit we do a little bit up here in Scotland have the wilderness, but like nothing like compared to the States, like and that down, down in England really um you know it's, it's such it's actually pe- the, the population is so dense um that you uh, uh that that you don't really get the huge patches of wilderness like the u.s has and yeah i i, I love that and uh yeah somewhere that i'd um yeah i'd love to take trains uh from coast to coast uh in the states at some point um yeah might, might have to book a few weeks off <laughs> Yeah, I'm planning on doing another one in August. Uh, my partner is doing a PhD based in uh, New England. Oh, in cool. Maine, so I think we're going to be doing a bit of train travel again. So yeah, my favorite one, my, my goal one is to do Chicago to New Orleans via like Memphis and uh, a bunch of other places. That one's kind of like bucket list one because there's just so many great stops on that down the Mississippi. So yeah, I can imagine that. Uh, that sounds awesome. Um, that yeah, that's uh, sort of giving me an idea on my bucket list as well. Um, I'd love to do that, and I'd love to go to New Orleans um, as as well. But yeah, that, it's an interesting answer, Denver, because um, we've had a few American cities on here. I think we've had uh, we've had San Francisco, obviously. Um, we've had Miami. Um, we've had uh, we, we've had Austin. We've had. Um, we've had new york um but no we haven't had denver yet and uh yeah i've always thought it sounds like a cool place so that's uh that's an interesting one um yeah i mean those cities you just listed are all ones that we have uh been supporting jobs on on otter since kind of september october mm. i don't think denver is one of them which is interesting <laughs> that i chose that but um yeah i think like is miami was one that stuck out to me like one that i'd never really considered but one that we decided to go to because it did have such exciting companies coming out of it and i think that yeah it's definitely that's matched up on my list from kind of again like cuban coffee culture but also like this great tech scene seems like it would be definitely somewhere i'd really enjoy going i'd love to go to miami but i'd need the spf 50 um i (laughs) I really don't know how to go like even edinburgh can be too hot for me sometimes um so yeah that uh yeah i would love to try that out and i've heard the uh, i've heard the tech scene there is is unreal um so that sounds uh, sounds really cool. And um, when you are uh, when when you are coding um, slash working, what kind of music do you like to listen to? Yeah, I I definitely listen to music and not podcasts. That's definitely like one thing. Like I I tried podcasts for a little while, and I just fi- found it. Especially as I moved into management, I found it so hard to engage with. Found it a little bit easier when I was younger. Um, but so it's probably I do like kind of old school nineties hip hop. Definitely like one of my kind of things that I like to listen to. Um, 
that it'd probably be something like that or something more on the acoustic end than anything mm. um but generally it would probably be kind of hip-hop r&b from kind of the 90s is my go-to um again i don't know if that's showing my age but <laughs> it's definitely uh definitely my kind of uh yeah vibe uh, 90s hip hop will never grow old. It's a it's a great genre. It's one of one of the great eras of a great genre. So yeah, um, yeah, I can uh, I can see why you like it. I was literally listening to a 90s hip hop playlist this afternoon when I was coding as well. Actually, um, it's uh, yeah, it's good stuff, particularly for a bit fed up with your code. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. And what what about when you like to do your work? Would you say you're an early bird, night owl? Definitely on the night owl side. I think when I look back on my early career, which was a bit more code intensive than what it is today, um, yeah, I'd be a up till three o'clock in the morning rather than get up at six o'clock in the morning. It was very much a yeah, work through the night when I needed to get something done or sorted. And yeah, I think that like I actually am quite good at that time. Um, I think as I've gotten older and kind of like moved away from kind of that just like head down coding kind of situation, then I'm progressively moving more towards the early bird. But I think, you know, touch wood maybe one day i'll have children and i think that i will definitely be both of them probably <laughs> um and yeah fairly kind of from both sides but i think you'll turn into an early bird at that point for sure yeah i think a lot of the people that have come on here that are parents uh, sort of say you know this is non-applicable it's just it's just whenever i can fit it in uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh speaking of children actually um when you're a kid um because you're a fellow career changer like me um what job did you want to do um back in the day so apparently the first job I ever wanted to do uh, was apparently be a vicar. I went to a church school when I was younger and apparently I wanted to be a vicar. Um, I don't think that stuck around for long, but <laughs> I definitely, I wanted to be a chef at one point and I did go on to uh, start a ca- catering company and work as a chef, which is something that I was really pleased about. Um, and yeah, it's kind of like I flitted, like I, I have this as a personality. I get quite um, addicted to kind of like hobbies and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden I wanted to become like my job. Um, part of the reason why I ended up in engineering. Um, and yeah, I think like cooking was one of those for me when I was younger, when I was a kid. Um, so I wanted to be a chef, which I did quite early in my life. Um, so yeah, it's definitely that was kind of my my biggest passion, I think interesting that sounds uh sounds really cool and i think that's the first time we've had a um potential chef on the podcast and well in fact you went, went on to do it so um i didn't actually doesn't mean i'm very good <laughs> doesn't mean i'm very good does not mean i'm very good uh well you're, you'll definitely be better than me at cooking um my girlfriend's away at the moment and i've literally ordered like prepared food uh for the entire <laughs> time that she's away just because i do not trust myself um to not make myself ill by cooking badly um so i, I didn't actually spot on your linkedin um about about the uh about the, the chef and catering days um because I, I saw you um is it geography you did your degree in um because my next question was yeah. going to be you you did an unrelated degree you got into design you, you seem to be a man who's worn a number of hats including a chef's hat um apparently in your in, in your years um before um getting into tech so so tell me a little bit about that how, how did the whole journey go oh god where do i start um so yeah, I did a degree in geography, um, but when I left college or when I was at college, I started working for a catering company, um, just um, kind of as kind of as a waiter, um, but also kind of wanted more hours. And I said to the person that ran it that I was really interested in cooking and could do it well, and kind of ended up being their right hand man. Mm-hmm. Um, and they ended up buying, uh, taking over a pub during my, I took a gap year and they took over a pub. So I ended up running the kitchen, um, that they bought the pub in for a while. And it was only a small little place, but kind of running all the services and doing kind of like Sunday roasts and, um, kind of like some specialist nights and stuff. Um, so when I was doing my geography degree, there was kind of two moments that, really like defined where I was going to go next one was I wasn't very good at going to lectures when I was in first year at all um and would do anything to do that and uh back in the day like Apple University was like quite a new interesting thing like it was something where uh, for those that don't know but you basically had a bunch of free courses that mainly American colleges would run um 
kind of through like an iTunes like store where you could sign up to them and you could do them. And one of them was Harvard CS50. And I started doing that rather than my coursework because it seemed more interesting. And I was really engaged. I can't remember um, the person's name that ran ran it, but they D- David very, Mallon. Yeah, David. Yeah, that's what David Mallon. And like, I found him so engaging, so energetic in talking about computer science that it just opened my eyes to something. And I did. I think I did like the first module or something like that. I found it really interested, and then got distracted. Didn't really think anything of it. And then when I was in my third year of university, um, I decided that me and my friend were going to start up a catering company to earn a bit of money on the side. And we needed a brand and we needed a name and we and we needed a website. So we did all of that ourselves. We didn't have any money. I think we started it with less than a hundred pounds. And so I decided to write the, the website from scratch. And I remember trying to get three circles in a line on uh, the homepage. And it was honestly the hardest thing I ever had to do but I never quit. And I was just like, no, I'm going to make this work, going to make this work. And that was the first website I ever built. And that weirdly led me to getting my first job out of university, which was as entrepreneur in residence at Bristol University, where I helped students and advise students on how to start their own businesses. And um, as part of that, it became really clear to me that there's tons of people out there with great ideas, but no skills to do it, both design and coding. So I started doing design on the side um, to earn a little bit more money when I was just coming out of university, pay off some debts. But also I was really interested in it. I thought like the kind of more like qualitative research of what goes into design was really interesting um, and decided that I'd kind of say like, hey, yeah, I'm going to be a designer, um, which was uh, kind of humorous to a lot of my friends where I was terrible at art, like so unbelievably bad at art. There are There is a clay cat somewhere in my parents' house, which is just an abomination of <laughs> like what artisticness is. You're going to have to put that clay cat on Instagram or something now, um, on, it, or, I, on LinkedIn even, uh, now that you've said that. <laughs> I will try, I will dig it out and I will put it on. Um, no, put but, it in the podcast description. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I... Um, But like, yeah, it's actually a really important part of like finding this creativity. And actually, I owe a lot to engineering to allow me to find this creative side of me. So um, when I left that job, um, I decided to move to Nottingham with my girlfriend, where she's from originally. And I was fortunate enough to land myself a junior designer role in a agency called Distinction, who were about, I think, 10 people strong at the time. And um, I got a junior design role somehow. Um, and I was there for two months. And then a Angular JS project came up where we didn't have any engineers for it, but we needed to do it. We already had a contract to doing the back end um, and we needed someone to do the front end. And I kind of said, yeah, I'll give it a go. And my manager, who was my manager for six, seven years, I remember him saying to me, hey, like, we can't really give you that much support because we've got this other massive project on that's really, really important and we really need to focus on it. So you, if you do it, you're kind of like by yourself with this one person. I was like, I back myself, I'll do it. And I never looked back from that point, really. Like, it just took me and all of a sudden my weekends and evenings and nights were just filled with learning how to code. And I became addicted to learning how to code and to get better at it and to immerse myself in it um so that's kind of how i how i ended up there i think when i then look back my geography degree did have a coding unit in it in a language called r i didn't really realize at the time that that was actually teaching me a lot of fundamentals about javascript so what is a loop for example i kind of knew what a loop was straight away i had to have a, a bit of a refresher but i was like oh okay i've kind of done this before and it's just like this module that I hadn't thought about twice since I did it. It was like very much did it. The lectures were really boring, but I was okay at it as a module as as things went. Actually was laying these foundations that I didn't even know I would need at some point. And it's kind of like this happy coincidence that I kind of landed in something which then kind of allowed this analytical part of my brain but also created part of my brain that could go right problem solving here's how you do it and coding is the way that you're going to do that and it's just opened so many other doors to me that i've just been super excited about ever since i started coding 
Fantastic. That's a, that's a really cool story. And yeah, it sounds like you've you've basically managed to see a lot of different sides of the uh, product development life cycle um, pretty early on in your career. So I guess that's really helped. Um, and you're an engineering manager now. Uh, so what's a typical day in the life like for you? Do you code much or is it mainly like people management? Yeah, so at Otter, being the first, so I was the first engineering manager to join, like, I was fortunate enough to kind of help try and craft what that looks like for us and what success looks like for us. So I do try to keep my uh, ear to the ground in terms of like being involved. So I will look over PR reviews that the team have up daily all the time, kind of checking in on like what we're working on, commenting when I feel like it's appropriate and where I can add value. Um, since kind of January, like it has been all hiring. So I haven't done tons of coding this quarter and that's okay. But I think like as the ebb and flows of, of our kind of product life cycle go, I do still try to get involved. I think more where I impact now from a technical perspective is on like more strategic vision, more kind of coming up with like our actual like strategy and whether we're staying on track with it rather than kind of like actually writing lines of code. Um, I think the most code I've written has been in kind of pair programming interviews that we do here at Otter um, rather than kind of like actually in the day to day, which is quite a hands off version of engineering management that I know exists in the industry elsewhere. Um, but it's one that I think suits my skills really well i like to think so anyway and um the people side of the business is definitely now where i get the most energy from whenever i'm working yeah uh, that that makes a lot of sense and i i i reckon i see myself going down the same uh, line eventually as well it, uh, i can see how much value you can get out of helping other people be the best they can be so that sounds uh, that sounds really cool and um obviously um, it took a lot of work to get to the point where you're uh, able to manage people. And how have you been able to effectively upskill throughout your career? Is there any strategies you'd recommend? Because um, as I'm sure you'll be humble about it, you did advance very quickly, uh, as anyone can see from your LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, I think it's interesting. I think when I've chatted to some people in this hiring cycle, the one thing I would say is when you come from a non-tech perspective, background so like let's say traditional let's say traditional computer science and this is no knock on computer science students whatsoever because they know things that i would can only dream of knowing is that yeah okay like lots of people feel intimidated about that and i think that you have to flip the narrative in your head and you have to say i bring skills from my previous life whether that be chefing waiting whatever it is you did is kind of other job before you came into it and say, that's my superpower. And that's how I'm going to differentiate myself in the market is yeah. Okay. I'm not going to be this person, but I've got incredible soft skills. I can work well with other people. I can understand problems in a completely different way to other people. So I think that like the thing that I always knew and had confidence in is that I'm very confident chatting to people. I always have been quite a, a people focused person just in my day to day life. Um, and I'm quite happy having uncomfortable conversations or challenging other people. And I always knew that that was where I could add value and impact immediately. And it was all about early years of my career was actually just focusing on the um, on the actual hard skills, the kind of like, how well can I program? Like, how well can I fix issues? And I kind of knew that once those skills kind of got up to the level of which my soft skills were at, then I would be kind of have this whole package that I think that, you know, I knew would be competitive in the workplace um, and be able to add a lot of value to the clients when I was working in an agency that I'd be able to bring this technical mindset where I'd understand databases, I'd understand code, I'd understand the problems from a technical perspective, but be able to frame it in a way that can be digestible across everything. And when I was thinking about upskilling, I always had, kind of had this mantra is I would never want to be in a room where someone could pull the wool over my eyes about something and I would just have to blindly trust in something. Um, and I think that that is because I can be a bit of a control freak when it comes to some things. Like I like to feel like I'm in control. So I did a lot of kind of just surface level stuff in marketing and in design and 
I then kind of like to think that like you can become a translator where if you have these soft skills and you have this way of being able to connect other people, but also have this technical knowledge, you can translate requirements and be able to say, hey, we're kind of all saying the same thing here, but actually like here's how this is going to have to come out in a kind of technical design document or whatever. Um, So I think like for me, like in terms of like the strategies, I think there's a couple of things that really stand out to me is don't be afraid of who you are and the skills that you already have that are not technical. Like those are actually defining traits that some people who have all the technical skills in the world have sometimes a much harder battle to try and learn because generally they're they're much harder to learn later in life than personally, I believe kind of technical skills are. Um, I think the second one is like, you know, it does take a lot of work to be a programmer like and actually learning to code is actually really challenging and there were many nights staying up till three o'clock in the morning learning how to code and you don't have to do that but like you have to make a commitment that actually like coding is a real language the same way that learning French is a real language like you have to learn and that's not about to clarify that's not about JavaScript or Python or anything it's understanding programming and software engineering and i think that leads me on to my last point which is think about software programming don't think about languages because i think like if you can be technology agnostic where you can just be a problem solver by thinking about technical problems a loop is a loop and it doesn't matter whether you write that in python or whether you write that in javascript like we have we have a take home task for our jobs here at Otter and we anyone can write in any language they want and we see java we see python we see c sharp we see javascript i'm not an expert in all of those languages but well written code in any of those languages you should be able to figure out pretty much what each of those things are doing because they're all equitable to between one another they have strengths they have weaknesses but actually if you're a good kind of solid fundamental programmer that is so competitive in comparison to being like i know everything in c sharp but like you take yourself out of that paradigm like oh like i don't really know what i'm doing like i i personally have tried to spend a lot of my time thinking about like what are those fundamentals that apply across all languages that then allow me to have those conversations at a high level yeah absolutely and i definitely agree and i think it's something that people get stuck on a little bit they do get so focused on learning languages um, and I almost don't even like the word programming language because of that. Um, I, I think learning to code is a language. Like you say, it's a way of um, how you think about things. Like the average person on the street doesn't think about how to write a loop. Um, but, uh, you know, a JavaScript developer and a C Sharp developer and a Golang developer um, will all think about that. Um, and, you know, like you say, really good code, anyone should be able to read it. And there are some languages where obviously that's like, a, like I know like Ruby on Rails is like a huge point of pride. Uh, like Matthew, who was on here a few weeks ago, was saying, um, and he's a huge advocate for Ruby on Rails, and he, he was saying that uh, uh, the, the whole point of it is that he writes code, so if he could show his mum, who doesn't code, uh, and she could get what was going on, that's how he knows it's a good bit of code, um, which I thought was quite a cool way to uh, to think about it. Yeah, I think, the, I think the only thing like I would add on top of any of this, like when kind of say like, you know, uh, you know, did I move quickly in my career? Like maybe, but like, I think like it, it bears saying that like that comes from an immense place of privilege, like as a white male in the tech industry, mm-hmm. like you have doors open to you that other people just don't have. And I think that that's really important to acknowledge. I think the other thing is that I was in a fortunate position where I could be up till three o'clock in the morning and coding. And, you know, I know like single parents who may want to make that transition into the tech industry. How do you get that time to do that? That's really, really challenging. And I think that we have a lot to do in the pe- as the people who are already in the industry to think about how we can break down some of those barriers mm-hmm. to lessen that barrier to entry for people so that it doesn't take your kind of like white male 20 year old who can kind of throw a lot of hours at it, a lot of work at it and they're the ones that manage to get successful is actually that to me is you know very good for myself as a self complete selfish kind of train of thought but actually as an industry i think we should also be challenging that and saying like hey would that have also been possible for other people Mm -hmm. and it's something that when i think about otter and like how we're trying to build our engineering team i'm definitely constantly trying to think about like hey how would we enable people from all different backgrounds to be able to come in and be successful in different ways 
Yeah, it's hard work to get to total meritocracy, but it's it's a um, journey that's worth um, putting in the work towards for sure. And I was talking about this on a live uh, on TikTok uh, earlier today, actually, where um, you know I, I didn't. Uh, I'm, I'm very hesitant to say that. Uh, I got here, you know, uh, as a, a retrained software engineer, 100% of on my own merit. And because uh, I was very lucky, I was saying, you know, I'm very lucky to, uh, I, I paid for it myself, but I had a family that I could go to if I wanted to um, for that. And, you know, I was, uh, like you say, I was in a position as well where I could stay up to 3 a.m. Um, and I wasn't having to, you know, look after a kid or work night shifts at a hospital or something, you know, um, very lucky uh, in that respect. And yeah, I agree. It's definitely uh, important to acknowledge that and the best way you can do that is by helping other people break into the industry for sure and uh, yeah so that's kind of the point of the code of career as well yeah. so hopefully you know if you're if you're struggling to code right now and you're and you're and you're listening then you know just keep plugging away and you know um join the discord and 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 uh, chat chat uh, chat with us as well like if there's anything people can help with they've got a friendly community um on there of people either that have learned to code or are learning so um, it's a good good mix. Anyway, plugging my own Discord server. Regardless, <laughs> um, we talk a bit about um, earlier about different programming languages. What do you see as the future of the web dev industry, like from a bird's eye view? Yeah, I think it's I think it's quite fascinating that I think my my thoughts on that have changed depending on where you are in the industry, like being in a product team is very very different to being at an agency where you're servicing clients um because i think in the latter like servicing clients i think no code platforms will take over like i've got no doubt about that i think that there are a lot of websites out there information brochure led sites where the tools will get so good and the deployments so easy and well managed by companies that that crack that nut that you know I know like you've already had things like Shopify kind of really take over the e-commerce market and stuff that actually for where you're not maybe have tons of IP in the actual tech that you're trying to do it's just a means of distributing information I really think that no code tools will continue to grow to the point where you have kind of visual designers who are dragging and dropping and creating really custom, amazing content. I mean, Webflow is a great step forwards in that direction, but I think that that will continue to be the case. However, in product, I don't think that that's as true because I think a lot of what you're building there is your own ideas and IP around actually like what you're building. And I think that the dev industry as a whole like is like, actually in a lot more secure place than I think in that kind of like more agency brochure led environments that side of things I think it's kind of a little bit of a race to the bottom in terms of price and I think that with the rise of robots that's just going to get worse I think it's a complete opposite in product and I think that you're seeing that in kind of like the employment market etc I think for us um, I think it's going to be I think JavaScript will die would be my big bet I, th I that's think that's a hot that take uh, I, are you saying it'll be replaced by TypeScript or are you saying something else will take over? I'm saying that I think that there will be a move forward away from JavaScript being the just like the workhorse that it is to do the things mm -hmm. that it's doing. And I think the WebAssembly, as it matures and it becomes something like and frameworks take over like i mean blazer and c sharp is already trying to take over it's kind of javascript-esque but it's kind of c sharp like i think that like the limits of javascript and like how it has completely taken over shows how there is like this growth that needs to happen in a more mature market for tools um you know you only have to look at every single I think pretty much every single front end related job on Otter will probably require React, maybe Vue, maybe Angular, but like it's pretty much just React. Yeah, React has paid and, my bills like nothing else for the past four years. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and like it's crazy, right? Like when I started my career, and that wasn't that long ago, like it's Angular 1.x, and that was like, and maybe Ember and a couple of others. And all of a sudden, you've just had this complete tidal wave of just like JavaScript is front end development. Mm -hmm. And I think it's resulted in some pretty poor practices and I think some pretty poor fundamentals. I think when I look at actually like that big claim, I think that like that could potentially die one day. I do think that like new frameworks like Remix 
are rehashing and using JavaScript as the language to output something which is more sound on a web fundamentals level. And I think that that kind of thinking will start coming into all of the frameworks. So I think that JavaScript may end up still being around, but it will be better and it will be more performant and i think it will be Mm. based around more solid web fundamentals but i do think for more and more companies that can use some of their back-end technology on the front end that is also going to mean that javascript will end up becoming what it should be being used for rather than as kind of like the crutch around that everything kind of like revolves around on the web right now yeah that's uh it's an interesting point and i want yeah i i, I could see it happening as well I, I agree um i think remix as well you mentioned remix i think that looks very cool and i've been playing around with that a bit recently so um it'd be interesting to see and you know if things get more performant it's only a good thing right and uh you, we've obviously talked around otter a little bit about job posting so people might have got an idea of what it is um i've been aware of you guys for um quite a while actually um just because obviously me coming from the recruitment background myself, I've always got an eye on recruitment technology. Tell us a bit about Otter and, you know, how and why people should use it to get a job or hire people themselves. Sure. Uh, Let me take you on a bit of a journey from a personal (laughs) anecdote first. I think like uh, job, job hunting is shit. Like I'll just say it. Like it it, is the worst part of being an engineer and it, it really sucks. And I made this pretty, I'd been a uh, distinction for around seven years and decided it was time to make a move. And I didn't take that decision lightly, lightly um, and decided to start job hunting. So I turned to everyone's big favorite blue monster um, LinkedIn to kind of like start trying to apply for jobs. Um, and I didn't have any success. I, you know, I was, it was a complete failure. I didn't manage to land a single response from anyone but Monzo, which it was absolutely shocking that it came from Monzo, but I didn't even have a response from anyone. Um, so I got remarketed by Otter, I think on Instagram, because uh, we, our, our marketing team are really good at hitting Instagram for, um, yeah, getting candidates. Um, I say your TikTok campaign is really good as well. I keep seeing that come up. I really like it. Good. Yeah. I mean, I think we're very proud of that one as well. Um, yeah. Our marketing team is absolutely killing it at the moment. Um, so yeah, shout out to Sarah and Samantha on that one. Um, but yeah, so I applied, to, I joined Otter, was really impressed with um, the user interface and I'll come back to kind of like what Otter is in a second. And I applied for, I think, f- five roles really quick and easy and i got three interviews straight away and i was like what black magic is this how is this working like how have i just suddenly got three interviews um so i saw the otter uh, looking for engineering managers and i was like well i want to work for a company that is you know doing this like this seems really cool so that's how i kind of applied and you know i think i i think i might have uh might have started my why do you want to work for otter statement with i effing hate job search (laughs) i don't hate it on otter and it was huge and when since i've joined the company it's really clear why that is so for those that you don't know otter so otta is a candidate first job search platform and we believe that we will win by putting the candidates first rather than job recruiters first um and as someone now on the other side of the table i am a hiring manager um you can say like well doesn't you know doesn't that make life hard but we really believe that if we create the best platform with the best candidates on it and we put them front of mind for every decision we make about the product candidate first is one of our company values at otter we will win and I think that we are showing that in kind of the traction we have gained uh, in the kind of questions that we ask. The sign up process, I think, is is fantastic. Um, and the way in which we present jobs to you is in a job deck where you see one at a time. And we do things like gender breakdown. Um, we have like an otter's take, which tells you kind of like our approach on the company. And I think like something that's super interesting that people kind of when you peek behind the curtain is like all of this is actually really like validated by humans. So we go out and we find the companies we want on Otto and we ask them to be a part of the platform. We put them on like it's something that like I don't think people see, but like we're really like 
picky about who's allowed on the platform. We won't just have anyone. And we do that based around the places that we want candidates to find jobs in fantastic places and work out. Um, and yeah, so I think like for me, like the the super interesting thing when you look at then joining the company is that you talk to people in Otter and every single person has a similar story of kind of like, didn't really enjoy job search and I found Otter and then I came here. And then you get into this amazing positive feedback loop where everyone is then at the company because they all have this shared value of kind of like, job search really, really doesn't work for lots of people. And I'm now at a place where we're trying to make it work for people. And therefore, like you have this amazing kind of like, yeah, union of different ideas. And it's a fantastic culture to be a part of. But yeah, I think like, we're, we're definitely always putting that candidate front of mind whenever we're making our product decisions. And I think that that's just something that is very, very different to what is out in the market in the recruitment space right now. Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds really cool, and it's an area that is uh, ripe for disruption. And having previously worked for a uh, a recruitment uh, tech recruitment disruptor that will re- remain nameless, for seeing as I'm interviewing you, um, but I worked there for a couple of years, and uh, yeah, it's an area that is uh, yeah desperately needed uh, to disrupt. And it's it's O T T A. It's not like the animal, is it? It's O T T A. No, it's O T T A. We do have a plush toy otter uh, in the office, but yeah, it's O T T A. Does, does the name come from the otter, the animal, or, or is it just like an acronym or something? No, it actually comes from, uh, I can't remember what country, uh, town. It's, a, it's named after a town or city um, in one of the Scandinavian countries. Um, and we started life off um, under a different name and had to change it. Um, and we had to change it quite quickly. Um, I say we, this was before I joined the company, but Sam, Theo and Zav, when they were, uh, when they were changing it, um, and they just drew up a load of lists of different things. And then they kind of picked one that they sounded like the sound of new, new, no, no one else had it. And um, yeah, and then we worked with a company to create a, create the brand, which I think is really excellent. And um, yeah, I think like it's, it's worked really well for us. Yeah, it, it's it's often the case where someone has changed a name so early on. Like the company that I mentioned earlier that will remain nameless um, literally changed its name because they snagged a domain name they didn't think they could get. So they're like, actually, no, we've got this great domain name. We can't change it now. Uh, so that that's why they changed their name, um, which fair, fair play. I think it was actually quite a good decision. Um, but yeah, anyway, um, so it, it, if someone has uh, listened to this whole thing and uh, really – already gone a bit of advice on on you know why to learn uh, why they should learn to code um how would you what what would you say i'm really butchering this but what would you tell them to do uh like if someone let's say your nephew um i don't know if you have a nephew uh, comes to you they've left school um they're 18 and they say you know billy i want to be a software engineer what do you advise them to do next they don't know how to code i think you can go a long way with a lot of free tools. I don't think you have to chuck lots of money at... I think boot camps are fantastic and I think they're a great way of entering the market. I think that they, they can be very, very expensive. And I think that actually, like, you can get a long way to get teach yourself some really basic skills with some fantastic free courses. I mean, you only have to use YouTube to learn anything. Like that's a motto in life that drives, I think my partner crazy when I'm doing weird DIY (laughs) things. But like, I think it's true of coding as well. Like you can learn lots and lots of stuff just through kind of like free materials. So I think that like for people that really haven't picked up anything, like I always think that like, you can kind of get quite a long way for free and work out whether you really enjoy it. Like, are there things that you're getting energy from, from this experience before maybe looking at like a boot camp or something like that, if that's what you want to do. Um, but I think like kind of removing yourself from that is something that I wish I had done more in my career is go out and find mentors, like approach people like myself. I imagine like yourself, Cam, like approach people and say like, Hey, like I'm really interested in this, but I don't really know how to navigate the industry. I don't Mm -hmm. understand some of this stuff is reach out to people. I think you'd be so surprised at how warm people would be to helping others. People are remarkably friendly. Uh, I was going yeah. to one of the quotes when I worked in uh, the work, uh, the job I enjoyed least in my life was working for a recruitment agency. And uh, I remember one of them saying to me when he was describing what Stack Overflow was, and I quote, he goes, yeah, developers like helping each other. They're really weird, <laughs> said without <laughs> irony. <laughs> yeah, and I, th- I think it's true. Like, I think like 
I think the thing is, is in software engineering, and I, I think it's true in other industries, but hard for me to say is like, you really rely on the first people that you work with to help teach you the ropes and show you things and to do that. Like I owe a lot of my career to, to Dean. Um, he, he was the contractor. I worked on the project that I said earlier in the podcast and like, he really taught me like the fundamentals of being a good programmer. And when someone has given that up to you for free as part of like your work, you kind of feel like you need to pay it forwards. And I think that there are so many people out there and I don't think I, I probably still don't take advantage of this enough of reaching out to other engineering managers for advice and mentorship. Like I think it can be really intimidating, but what I'd encourage anyone that wants to get involved is, you know, reach out to people and you'd be so surprised at how how warm they are to help you do that and give you really specific pieces of advice. Like, you know, if you're like, hey, like, I don't know if I want to spend 15 pounds on this Udemy course is like looking through it and going like, hey, like, uh, yeah, like I would do that for anyone is like, you know, like a little bit of a keen eye on kind of like, do you think this would be any good? And I don't think I'm unique in that perspective whatsoever. So I think like if you see companies you admire, reach out to them and like they can become your champions they can give you that pep talk when you're when you're down about the fact that you've applied for maybe 10 jobs and not heard back back from anything and they can work on you when you get interview feedback they can give you advice and say hey like yeah that's probably really good advice like here's how i would go about improving myself in those kind of ways because they're just your potentially your cheat code to learning about things that otherwise if you're just by yourself it's going to be a lot longer for you to learn that and you can do it and you can do it well, but like you could lean into other people as well. And I think that that's just something that everyone should take more advantage of than I think than what they do right now. I would encourage any experienced engineers uh, that are listening right now to at least mentor one person if you can, uh, just because you don't even know what a difference I can make in someone's life. Um, if you have a good mentor, like, uh, um, someone who I would consider my mentor, he he works at um, Meta uh, now. And, you know, I, I never would have broken into the industry had I not had a chance meeting with him when I was a recruiter. So, um, you know, it, it, it helps so much to have a, have a, um, have a great mentor um, for, for sure. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that's kind of roughly going towards the end now, but I, I wanted to first off, thank you for coming on. It's been really insightful. Um, thank you for having me. Well, it's, uh, yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, so, so for people who want to know a bit more about Otter, either to get a job through Otter or to get a job with Otter, um, what what's the best way they can go about that? Especially if they want to work for you directly. So, if you want to work for us directly, um, you should sign up to Otter anyway, because <laughs> if in case it doesn't work out, there are lots of fantastic jobs, especially for software engineers on Otter. Um, but if you, if you, you can reach out directly to me on LinkedIn, um, which obviously you'll be able to find in the podcast description. Um, and yeah, or, and I'm just willing to have like a a chat with you, like just informal chat, what you're looking for, what we're kind of offering and what our, what our kind of plan is and kind of walk you through our kind of application process, um, is the best way, but you can also just sign up on, um, otter.com. Um, and that will give you kind of like the the pro you know the opportunity to set up your profile and then you'll be able to see jobs and um provided you're looking for software engineering um within our salary bands um which i imagine you would be if you are a entry-level programmer then um you're likely to get given the otter job at some point provided you say that you don't hate recruitment cool that sounds good and also as well if people have friends and family that aren't engineers but are looking for other types of jobs you you offer those as well don't you on the uh, uh on the platform yeah so yeah that's it's a good point so it's actually um like any tech industry jobs but they're they're kind of companies in the tech industry so we do mm-hmm. have jobs for marketers uh in hr people directors positions like that so it's very much like do you want to break into the technology space and obviously you know every technology company will need like a finance director or something like that as well so there's lots and lots of different skill uh, skills and jobs available on otter actually like software engineering is only like a small part of what we service um so yeah if you are listening you're not a software engineer there's also um yeah definitely sign up to offer as well to be fair as, as interesting as our chat has been I, I would commend someone who's had 48 minutes of uh, software engineering chat if they don't know what we're talking about fair play um but yeah de- definitely for anyone who's got like friends and family that aren't coders but want to get a job in the tech industry because i've seen your platform it's super easy to use your uh, and uh, the ux is awesome so um yeah it's really cool i definitely recommend 
um, people check it out for sure. But yeah, thank you again for coming on today. Um, it's been really insightful and interesting and uh, to hear how much you've accomplished in, in uh, your, uh, you were saying how old you felt earlier on, but you're not that old. Come on. No, I know. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think like it's, it's just amazing. Like, I think, you know, I mean, my, my engineering team is absolutely phenomenal. Like they are so talented and, you know, I look at the age of some of them and what they're already <laughs> achieving. And like, it does just make you look back on the fact, you know, one of the girls in my team, she's graduating today and kind of like, oh, that feels a long, long time ago because that was before I even started coding. So, you know, it feels like I shouldn't have eight years of coding behind me. But um, yeah, that's what time does, I guess. <laughs> Oh, time, especially in the last couple of years. But the less said about COVID, the better. We've managed to go this long. I was going to say we managed to avoid it for (laughs) forever. Yeah, it's the law of the law of twenty twenty to twenty twenty two. The 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 c word has to come up. Uh, COVID, not the other one, uh, at some <laughs> point during any discussion. Anyway, before I accidentally drop any bad words, thank you again, Billy. It's been uh, great to speak with you, and uh, it's been a really awesome episode. And thank you as well, all the listeners, for checking out another episode of the Code of Career. Um, I hope you have a great week. And in the meantime, if you uh, want some more fix of TCC content, check us out on TikTok and join our Discord server. Have a great week.